Thanks for staying with us. Uh, world leading AIDS researcher Quraysha uh, Abdul Karim has been elected to serve as the seventh president of the World Academy of Sciences for the Advancement of Science in Developing Countries. Now she will serve as the president uh, from next year until 2026. And let's speak to her now um, about this. And of course, uh, Prof. Quraysha is Caprice's Associate Scientific Director. Thank you so much for your time this evening. First of all, congratulations. I mean, the first woman to serve in this role as president and of course looking at the work that now lies ahead for you i'm certain you have time to you have had time to process all of it how are you reacting to all of this thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and for your warm congratulations uh, so uh, clearly it's a real honor and privilege to have this opportunity to serve the global scientific community, and uh, it's also a humbling experience. Um, I am the seventh uh, to be president-to-be, and uh, there's a long line of uh, individuals and the council that has played a big role in getting to us to where it is today. So those are big sh shoes to fill, but a wonderful opportunity to also think about how we can strengthen the organization further. And Prof, talking about that very last point that you've made, I wonder what are some of your priority areas for you as you are now going to be going into this role? So firstly, um, you know, there have been very strong foundations that have been uh, laid by my predecessors uh, to enable the vision of the founder, um, Nobel laureate Abdul Salam, who really wanted to use science to enhance the quality of lives of people in low middle income countries. And so that's a vision that's not going to change, but um, we've taken a number of steps. The, initially, it was about just training people um, in PhDs and supporting postdocs, creating mentorship programs, ensuring some of the gender issues are addressed. But most importantly, I think uh, the two really important things that have uh, uh, emerged in the past few years has been how do we locate science development and solutions to the sustainable development goals. And uh, in a world with widening inequities and inequalities, that becomes um, even more important. And then second is how do we ensure that the solutions we come up with, the evidence that we have for the many challenges across scientific disciplines actually get to those who would benefit most. And that requires engagement with communities and also with key decision makers, be they donors or governments. And so, um, and then the third part would be around the gender issues. Yeah. And it's it really amazing that uh, for the first time, uh, the council coming in is 50% uh, women and 50% men, a reflection of um, the investments that have been made over the years to ensure um, adequate women representation um, and, and to see that number of women um, achieving such uh, great levels of scientific excellence, yeah. for me, it's very rewarding. And especially when you look at what, you know, UNESCO said, for example, in 2021, that on average, you know, national progress around the world has been, uh, you know, weakest for the core when it comes to, to the SDGs. But, uh, you know, Prof, also another issue as you talk about, you know, the gender issues. The UN this year, um, earlier this year, really, uh, you know, talking about how grant distribution is also not, the, you know, the fairest when it comes to, to women. And you look at some of the stats, they saying that women are typically given smaller research grants than their male counterparts and this is something you know that really must change if we are going to see gender um you know parity in this particular space where women are also seen to be you know equal to the task of conducting this important research Absolutely. Um, we, we're definitely seeing more women, mm. but they are the women who are uh, getting to these points have to work a lot harder. And I do believe this is the 21st century, 
and issues of gender parity should be have long been dealt with. Yeah. So these are overdue issues. I think with COVID, we've seen that women again bear the brunt of uh, disparities. They're not always um, they, uh, you know, as scientists having to bear heavier burden in terms of parenting responsibilities and household chores. But I think we have to move beyond that. And this is the moment where uh, gender uh, parity, gender equity issues and gender inequalities have to be something that we make um, something in the past and um, that all of us, Mm. uh, regardless of gender, are able to reach our full potential. And, uh, you know, we speak just after um, COP27 and, and, and a lot of talk has been said about that to say there's so much that is still being spoken about, yet very little when it comes to support for developing countries and even the important work that you talk about getting to people on the ground who are feeling the impact of these adverse climate conditions. I wonder how do you then begin to change that? Because your organization also looks at the issue of training, but how do you begin to get into that space to make sure that some of these talks that we are seeing in these big conferences and big organizations translates to what needs to be much needed change on the ground? So the focus of the World Academy of Science is on developing countries and ensuring sustainable development. Yeah. Um, And and that was set by the uh, founder of the World uh, Academy of Science. I think that using the sustainable development uh, framework and us all approaching the uh, midterm to take stock uh, is a really important point to be not thinking about issues in isolation. Because what we are seeing and the uh, point we've reached is a convergent convergence of multiple challenges that face us. So even if we take an issue like climate change um, and we think about it in the context of the African continent, the majority of the households here are female headed and we have a lot of subsistence farmers. And what we see with climate change is that, um, again, these households, the most vulnerable, also have um, a female face. Yeah. And um, and the science that we do can't um, t- be done in a piecemeal fashion. We have to be engaging with the communities whose lives we want to change. We simply cannot depend on um, key decision makers doing the right thing. And I believe it's that partnership um, that's going to make a big difference. That. It's a, it's a co-knowledge generation process where we are working very closely with the communities um, whose trajectories we want to change. And I think as long as they're not part of the discussions, the deliberations and finding solutions, then I think we're just working in the wrong space. And I suppose that's what, uh, you know, the the UN calls an international collaboration that is going to be required to make sure that things are done differently uh, going forward. And, 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 and Prof, I mean, I wonder, what has been the appetite like from various governments? Are you finding that given, you know, some of the recent events that we've seen that have culminated science into, you know, the spotlight that, that it finds itself in right now? Yes, it's been always important, but right now the focus is huge shifted. Are you finding that more and more governments are starting to prepare for this and putting money into science projects and making sure that there's such a collaboration here that is also helping to beat some of the impact on the ground? So I think there's a greater appreciation of the importance of science in society. Uh, I think that we have a way to go where that uh, rhetoric is um, is changed and where we see the financial commitments. So for example, there was an agreement made several decades ago where 1%, 1% of the GDP of each UN member country goes towards research. And to date, there are only a handful of countries from low middle income countries that meet that target. So they are challenges there, but I don't think they're insurmountable challenges. Mm. 
I think COVID has reminded us the importance of science. It's also reminded us that we need to um, break down some of the monopolies in terms of uh, new products and solutions and interventions. And we need to build regional capacity that was best demonstrated in terms of the challenges we have faced with the um, COVID vaccine access and continue to face in terms of COVID treatments. And um, we've started to see, for example, in South Africa, where there's been more investments in local manufacturing and capacity building. So we've done a lot in terms of discovery science in South Africa and doing the clinical trials. Now we've got to get to playing a bigger leadership role, um, as in other low middle income countries, uh, to start to lead the questions that are the highest priority in our countries yeah. and regions, and then let the signs um, guide that. It's also a challenging time because um, there's a lot of politicization of the signs. And we also have seen with COVID how uh, disinformation is so widespread. And so we have to um, put in the effort and ensure as scientists that we do a good job about communicating the correct facts and what is right and um, and ensure that the best evidence uh, comes forth and to find solutions for our diverse range of challenges. All right, so Prof, congratulations. We are ever so proud. Uh, and of course, it's uh, well-deserved. Congratulations to you, Prof. Uh, that is uh, Prof Koresha Abdul Karim, Caprice Associate Scientific Director. Just to remind you, she's been elected to serve as the seventh president of the World Academic of Sciences for the Advancement of Science in Developing Countries.